Welcome back to uh, part two of Immanuel Kant's Ethics. Let me just start with um, a uh, quick recap of what we talked about. Kant and respect for the rational person. Uh, recall that for Kant, rational person is the basis of morality. We are rational. There's no dogs or uh, cats or uh, chimpanzees or trees or uh, anything else that is more important than human beings because they are rational. Everything has, remember, either a price or a dignity. Uh, things that have a price can be replaced. Uh, things that have a dignity, like human beings, rational beings cannot be replaced. Another point was some of the, the, uh, the most important quotes, and I'd like to go back to uh, his quotes because now you understand the sense um, of those quotes. Morality is not the doctrine of how we may make ourselves happy, but how we may make ourselves worthy of happiness. Uh, for Kant, we, uh, we have to deserve happiness. For other moral theories, uh, if you remember from uh, the past uh, lecture on utilitarianism and the next one on virtue ethics, Happiness is a very important component. Now, of course, for Kant is also an important component, but Kant uh, has a very nuanced uh, uh, argument about happiness, that we have to deserve it. And uh, another quote, very important quote, is two things awe me most, the starry sky above me and the moral law within me. So according to Kant, the moral law is not derived from the air, the space, God, my family, your family, or anybody, but within me, within myself, because um, we are rational. Sometimes people are not rational, of course, but we are capable of being rational. And if we uh, uh, tend to uh, the laws of reason, we become sensible and we, uh, we understand that morality is a matter of rationality. In fact, uh, speaking of rationality and morality, for Kant, it's not that morality is something flexible, something that um, is like, like when you, uh, when you buy gloves or socks and, it, and they, they say, one size fits all. Not at all. For Kant, morality is about, it's really serious business. Why wouldn't it be serious business? So in morality, we, um, we have fixed rules. We have to be consistent. We cannot change our minds all over the place, all over the map. And the only way to, uh, to, to be sure that we are consistent in morality is to base our morality on something that never changes. Now, when I say never changes, I mean uh, in the sense that, for example, numbers don't change. The number two has been number two for millions and millions of years, and it will always be number two. And uh, the rules of logic um, will never change. For example, take an example. Um, I, Professor Alvaro, am the same person of myself. I cannot be and not be at the same time. I cannot exist and not exist all at once. That would be essentially absurd. So uh, that's the importance of morality. That's the importance, uh, I'm sorry, of reason. Um, and speaking of, of reason and, uh, um, and universality, according to Kant, this is not a, a difficult point or a, a controversial point to accept. When we uh, speak of morality, we are in the business of categorical rules. When I say to you, if you want to lose weight, well, exercise and eat better, eat more salad. That's easy, right? On the other hand, when I contemplate moral issues, abortion, 
capital punishment, gun control, um, any other moral, moral question, where we deliberate on certain moral issues, we are not saying, if you do X, then abortion is wrong. That's not what we do in morality, in this country. Rather, what we do is we, uh, we assume that our moral deliberation signifies categorical rules of morality. It's like the law. The law doesn't say, if you would jump turnstiles and... Uh, you are, you're eating popcorn, then I will give you a ticket. The law has no exceptions, and the law does not admit ignorance, but that's, that's not an important point. The point is, you, uh, you're not going to be able to uh, go in front of a judge and say, well, but I'm sorry, when I, when I jumped over the, uh, the turnstile, it is because my mother... Uh, said to me, quick, the train is here. That's not going to cut it. The law is the law. And the moral law for, for uh, Immanuel Kant is the same. It's the moral law. So, uh, moral uh, rules are not hypothetical. They are imperatives. They're categorically imperative. Now, remember this point, the basis for evaluating uh, conduct is a good will. Only a, uh, an individual, a rational individual, free and rational individual, can deliberate morally on the basis of a good will. That is the only way, okay? Nothing in the world can possibly be conceived which could be called good without qualification. Remember, the good will is good no matter what. So that's the only, the only way that you can act morally. Any other way, you're not acting morally because the goodwill guarantees you that you are doing something moral. But you have to do, you have to act uh, and your actions have to spring out, so to speak, of the goodwill. They shouldn't be in uh, conformity with the goodwill. Remember this, um, this example, this um, Venn diagram. In this Venn diagram, we learned that the goodwill is the only thing that is good no matter what. It's good without qualification. If you have a goodwill, you don't have to ask any questions. Okay? If you know that a person acted with a good will, from a good will, not in conformity, not in accordance with a good will. For example, um, a guy is drowning in a Hudson River, and I jump and I save him. I did the right thing. But Kant says, but you, you uh, have not done anything morally worthy until I determine why, the reason, the motivation, why did you rescue that person out of the Hudson River? And you say to me, oh, because I, you see that guy over there? He paid me $200 to do it. Well, then you say you're, you're doing the right thing, but for the wrong reason. The only, and it, make, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? To do a moral thing, to be moral, you have to do the right thing, for the right reason. Now, what's beautiful about this is that um, people can say to Kant, well, how do you know what the right reason is? And, and he actually has a very, very clever reply. I know because the good reason would be based on, on a rationality. The right reason, I'm sorry. The right reason is based on rationality, what is rational for me to do. So that's how the goodwill gets around. Goodwill 
anything else. Happiness can be misused. Money can be misused. Um, pleasure, knowledge, anything else is good, but not good without qualification. You can be very happy and murder people. You can be, uh, you can know the truth and, and be a, a, a horrendous human being. But guess what? If you have a good will, you see the point? All right, now, why not the golden rule? Because the golden rule, once again, is based on personal preferences. Do not do unto others what you don't want to be done to you. But I don't know what you want you want to be done or you don't want to be done to you. Maybe you like to, uh, to be cheated on, to be lied to. So the golden rule is not a good way to go. The end justifies the means. Oh, well, this is, this is the worst for Kant because um, what if I have to cheat, lie, kill, murder, pillage, rape, uh, just to, uh, uh, to uh, achieve a certain, uh, a certain end, a certain goal? That's horrible. How can we have morality like that? And once again, we're going back to personal preferences. Because when we, uh, when we say that the end justifies the means, well, the means are things that are chosen by you on the basis of your personal preferences, not on the basis of something uh, neutral, something objective. And religious morality is also not an option according to Kant because, um, first of all, for one thing, there are many people who are not religious. And there are many different religions and interpretations of God. And furthermore, we don't want people to obey the moral law just because God said so. God is not supposed to tell you what to do. Because, think about this. If you are a religious person, you probably believe that God gave you reason, gave you, gave you rationality. So, uh, it's not God that wants you to do X or Y. It is up to you because you are free, you have a free will, and you have to make a decision. That's the whole point of evil, isn't it? That evil exists because, well, people are free to decide whatever they want. But that's a discussion for another time. Now, I talked about this acting for the sake of duty and acting in accordance with duty. How do I figure out my duty? Remember Kant proposes this procedure, the universalizability principle. And it works this way. So the UP is the universalizability principle. Try to say that three times in a row fast. The universalizability principle. Universal so the universalizability principle says the following. I ought never to act except in such a way that I could also will that my maxim should become a universal law. Or in plain English, I always act in a way that is consistent with the, the universalization of whatever moral principle I'm using. So if you say, I want to, uh, um, say, cheat on my exam, you have to be willing that everyone cheats on their exams, but not just uh, sporadically, but as a universal principle. Can you imagine that? And it already makes sense if you put it that way. Imagine a world in which everyone cheats on their exams. Now, you're not going to be happy when you go to your doctors and you say, Doctor, I have this pain here in my neck and I have a lump. What do you think it is? Do you think it's a tumor? Oh, no, no, it's not a tumor. It's nothing. Maybe it's a mosquito bite. And in reality, it's a tumor. Um, and then you, uh, you're going to wonder why this guy is, is a doctor. Well, because he cheated on his exam. So that's just a, a silly illustration. Of the idea but that's the idea you're not gonna want you're not gonna will that everyone cheats on their exams 
just something that you, are, you, you don't want to do. If you're a perfectly sensible person, you would not want that as a moral. Well, who wants that as a universal moral rule, you're going to say? No one. And how does it work? As I said, you have to uh, state precisely your moral principle. I will cheat on my exam because it is convenient to me, essentially, because I need to graduate this semester. Okay? Now, according to Kant, um, to determine whether it is possible, there are exceptions in, 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 uh, in uh, implementing this, the, uh, the moral principle that I just uh, mentioned. You have to uh, ask yourself whether your moral principle can either be conceived or it can be willed. So a maxim is morally permissible if you can will that it becomes a universal law of morality or it is morally permissible if it is logically conceivable that it becomes a universal law of morality. Now, let's look at the examples. In part one, we ended here at the four examples. And with these four examples, you should get a sense of how Kant is, is going to use the universalizability principle. So the first example, as I said, is the lying promise. The second example is um, helping others. The third example is suicide. And the fourth example is that of cultivating your natural talents. Let's take the, uh, the first one, the line promise. Now, let me just uh, premise these four examples with one important caveat. I think I can speak for um, most philosophers when I say that the line promise is possibly the, the best example and unfortunately the only good example of how to implement the moral law. Or at least what I, what I mean by the best example is that it is the, uh, the one that is not controversial at all. It's very straightforward. Although I personally have my own problems, but guess what? I'm not going to tell you what my problems are with the line promise example because my opinion is irrelevant. What's relevant here is learning about Kant, Kant's philosophy, not what I, what I think. So the line promise, the example is the following. Imagine that you want to lie, make it, imagine you want, you want to, make a line promise, okay? A line promise um, to uh, obtain something for your personal benefit. Now, according to the universalizability principle, if I make an exception for myself, then I have to make an exception for all people. And not only that, I have to uh, uh, make not only an exception one, just one exception, but I have to be willing that my exception becomes a, uh, a rule of morality, a universal law of morality. As I already uh, mentioned earlier, it seems strange for anyone who is sensible, who is logical, to say that he or she will be willing to hold uh, the line promise as a universal uh, principle of morality. Because if that were the case, guess what? People would, would be able to lie to you, and that's not going to be good. So, so the, the, uh, the idea is that if I willed that a maxim of line should be become a universal law, then I would defeat my own goal. Because think about this, why am I making this false promise? Well, to accomplish a certain goal, which is to uh, 
say for example, obtain a, uh, a money uh, loan in advance. But if I am willing to uh, hold the line promise as a universal law of morality, then my goal is undermined by the very law of morality that I am upholding. Okay? Or another way to put it uh, is that the universal law lie whenever you need it to obtain something you, you want would be logically inconceivable. It would be like a, a thinking about the round square. Uh, how can you think of it? It's a square, but it's round. Those are two incongruent figures. That cannot be possible. Now, to be more specific, let me uh, clarify what Kant has in mind with an example. Suppose you are in a desperate need of money, and no one is going to lend you some money because they, they know your reputation. You're not good with money, okay? But the problem is that you, um, if you don't pay um, back a, uh, a debt, um, someone will break your legs. So you uh, you think about it and you uh, and you say to yourself, okay, I'm gonna make an exception for myself for this this once, and I'm gonna lie. I'm gonna lie to uh, to a person and say to uh, to her, hey Judy, listen, I really need money. Please lend me the money. I will pay you at the end of the week. But you are making a lying promise. You don't intend to pay it in a week because you know that you're not going to have money to pay your debt at the end of the week. Okay? You're making a lying promise. Now, the question for you is the following. What would be your maxim? What would be the maxim of this person, this hypothetical person? Think about it for a second before I, I turn the slide. What would be your maxim? How would you set up your maxim? I would lie, I would make a false promise. Now, the question is, are you even not are you ever justified in making an exception, in making a lying promise? The maxim, it seems to me, would be something like such. When in need of money, I will lie to a lender in order to get what I need. The universal law of this maxim would be everyone in need of money lies to lenders in order to get what, the, what they need as a universal principle of morality. Now, we finally get to uh, the, uh, the question. Is it possible to, for you to conceive logically or will that this becomes a universal law? Think about it. Can you uphold this as a universal law? Now, according to Kant, you cannot because this maxim fails number one. Remember, number one is a contradiction in conception, something illogical. Something uh, like the round square, remember? So, uh, Kant calls this a contradiction in conception. Why is it a contradiction in conception? Why is it like the round square? Well, according to Kant, it's obvious that there's something incoherent about your maxim. It's like saying, it's like saying this. I want to be healthy, therefore... I'm going to eat and I'm going to behave in a, in, in a way that is conducive to uh, the destruction of my body. Well, that's incoherent. You just said that you want to be healthy. That's what Kant think, um, thinks that this maxim lead, leads to. It leads to a contradiction in conception. Why? Because if 
if I universalize the maxim, there will be no money lenders if no one ever intended to, to repay money lent to him or her. I mean, think about it. If everyone lies whenever they, uh, they need some, some money, then imagine such a world where, uh, well, no one will lend you money, first of all, because they know that it's a universal law that everybody lies. So you come to me and you say, lend me some money, I'll give it back to you on the, at the end of the week. I'm gonna laugh in your face uh, because I know that you will not pay me back. So as a rational being, I cannot will this incoherence. So the lying promise maxim fails the universalizability test. Namely, it fails condition one, okay? So failing one means that we have a perfect duty not to make false promises, okay? Uh, or in other words, we must never, ever, ever, for any reason, for any exception, uh, make a false promise. Now, once again, you can say to Kant, who says that? You say that. What's beautiful, what I find at least beautiful about this, is that Kant can say to you, I am not saying that. It is reason that says that. Just think about what is rational, and you will see what I see, that your maxim is incoherent. All right, so we can discuss this in uh, in the forums. Um, just uh, feel free to discuss this or ask questions or email me if, if you don't get it. But but I think you you get it because it's very it's very simple. Okay, uh, everybody lies. No one wants to live in a world like that where everybody lies. First of all, and uh, and if everybody lies, then then no one would believe you if everyone lies. It is permitted to lie, okay? Now, let's look at the second example, helping others in need. Should I help others in need? Now, suppose you refuse to help others because you're selfish. You're a selfish person, or you just don't feel like it. You're not selfish. Um, you all always give the, uh, the homeless guy a sandwich, your sandwich, your lunch, uh, you give some money here and there. You're not necessarily selfish, but you just don't feel like it, okay? So uh, the question for you, once again, question for you. What is your maxim? What is the maxim of a individual who uh, is not willing to help others? Well, once again, it seems that the, uh, the maxim would be something like so. I will not do anything to help others in need in order to advance my own interest. And once again, the question for you is this, can you conceive or will that this maxim becomes a universal law? And once again, according to Kant, this does not pass the test. Now notice something interesting, that this maxim, I will not help people uh, just to advance my own interest, it certainly passes number the, the first condition. You see, it's logically conceivable. Don't you agree? There's nothing illogical, irrational, incoherent about not helping others. However, here's the point. According to Kant, it fails number two. Why? Because you cannot possibly know what, what, how you're going to be in the, in the future. Okay? You might be the one in need. And so if you are willing to uphold a rule of morality that says do not help anyone in need for any reason, categorically, Guess what? When you 
are the one in need, you are screwed. Now I know that some people say, oh, I don't care, I will never be in need. Well, when you were a kid, you were in need of a lot of things. When you were a baby, you were not self-sufficient. But guess what? Even if, as an adult, you're not self-sufficient. You need love. You need friends. You need um, a wife, a husband, a boyfriend, a girlfriend. You need a job. You need a, um, an employer. Am I right? You need a hospital. Imagine you go to the hospital, you get sick, and the hospital says, sorry. And you're going to say, oh my goodness, it was my fault. Because I made a universal law that says, don't help others to advance your interest. So you don't want to live in a world like that. You're not willing. You're not willing to will something like that. So consequently, according to Kant, we have an imperfect duty to help others in need. Okay? What that means is that when a, a, um, a principle of morality fails the first, um, uh, the first condition, then it, it means that we have a, uh, a perfect duty. We have to do it no matter what. We have to do it. Because it's, it's, it would be illogical. On the other hand, when we fail the second condition, um, certainly we are by by doing that or not doing that, we are we are not contradict ourselves logically. We we don't undermine our own goal, certainly. But it means that my maxim, your maxim, is what Kant, Kant calls. A contradiction in will. Essentially, something that you will you will never will. It's not irrational for you to be to will, but it is a contradiction in will. No one who is perfectly sensible and rational would uh, will that much. Okay. What about number three? Now we get into our to problems with number three. Suppose you are. Your life is horrible, and you want to commit suicide. Once again, the question for you is, what is your maxim? It seems to me that your maxim would be something like, well, let me, let me tell you what Kant has in mind. This is, a, I, I quote what Kant says, this would be the maxim. From self-love, this is very important, from self-love. So in other words, I love myself too much. I, that I make my principle, I make it my principle to shorten my life when its longer duration threatens more troubles than it promises agreeableness. So in other words, and you can see already why this, according to Kant, doesn't make sense. Because if you uh, love yourself, it will be absurd to will that you, uh, you kill yourself. So can you conceive or will that it becomes universal law? Well, according to Kant, it fails, number one, according to Kant. It fails the first condition, the, the rationality condition. Why? It is logically inconceivable for the reasons that I said earlier. There is something incoherent about willing your own death on the basis of the very impetus that keeps you alive. Because life, you are alive, and uh, it is ingrained it is natural for human beings to uh, perpetuate life. So how can, uh, according to your love, so to the love for yourself, 
you do something that is contrary to uh, the love of yourself. Suicide, the suicide maxim, is a contradiction in conception. And so, according to God, we have a perfect duty to preserve our lives. Kant's thought, um, as I said, is that out of self-love, you cannot go against your nature. Your nature, the nature of all human beings, is to perpetuate their lives, to continue to exist. That's why we make babies. We have children. To perpetuate our species. Okay? So, failing the universalization test means that the agent would contradict himself or herself by willing both to act on the maxim and that everyone also acts on the maxim. Remember? This is what the line promise is supposed to show. Remember that if I uphold the line promise as a universal principle of morality, then it, 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 it generates a, a logical inconsistency. Because if everyone lies, then it's absurd because no one will believe anyone. So, what about suicide? Does the suicide maxim make it impossible for the suicidal man to do what he wants to do, namely to commit suicide. Now, the lying promise makes it impossible for you to lie. Logically speaking, it makes it impossible because if that's, your, if that, if that's a universal law of morality, then it undermines, it is self-defeating. It undermines the very goal that you're trying to achieve. Your goal is to get money, right? But, it, but, but the, if the lying promise is upheld as a universal law of morality, then in a world like that, you're not going to get the money. So uh, you're going to defeat your own purpose. It's impossible. But what about suicide? Suicide is not the same because if you have a universal law that says, if your life is horrible, Kill yourself. Everyone has to kill himself or herself if his or her life is horrible. I don't see any any uh, contradiction in uh, a logical contradiction in that. Do you? If you do, well, please let me know. From Kant's explanation, the action is shown to be wrong, not because of some logical problem, right? Not because of the logical problem, but because it is in some way contrary to your nature. It's contrary to self-love. So uh, what's, what's the story here? Kant is not being consistent here. He, he's using a different argument here, it seems. So according to Kant, suicide is, not, is in no circumstance permissible. The man who commits suicide, he says, sinks lower and lower than the beasts if you are thinking i want to kill myself you become an animal an irrational animal nothing more terrible can be imagined for it because you remember going back before that we are irreplaceable we don't have a price the human life has no price has a dignity so if you uh, destroy your dignity you become an animal <clears throat> so for Kant, uh, uh, also, man, human beings are um, God's property. Your life does not belong to you, it belongs to God, so you, you have no right to dispose of your, of your own life any way you please. Man can only dispose of things, uh, objects, not lives. All right, now we get to uh, the fourth example. Developing natural talents. Um, there is an imperfect duty to oneself to develop one's natural talents. Now, if you don't have a desire to develop your natural talents, what is your maxim? Probably something like this. I will 
pursue lazy pleasures rather than work to improve myself. Why? Because I don't feel like it. Now, this maxim passes one, once again, um, it is conceivable to be lazy, right? There are a lot of people who are lazy. I'm sure you know many people who are lazy. And uh, certainly that does not uh, produce a uh, logical contradiction. So Kant claims that a rational being cannot will this maxim as a universal law because as a rational being, he necessarily wills that all the capacities in him be developed since they serve him and are given to him for all sorts of possible purposes. In a way, once again, Kant is saying that is your nature to have certain uh, aptitudes, certain capacities, and it, it, it would be uh, contrary to, to the will, to your own will, to pursue and um, nurture and, uh, and cultivate those, uh, uh, those capacities and improve yourself as, a, as an individual. But once again, Kant's rejection of the maxim has nothing to do with uh, um, universality in any way. Or maybe it, it does, but in, in a very, very weird way. Because Kant argues that such maxim would not hold as a universal law of nature. Okay? He's impressed with the idea that our talents, as I said, come from nature. Nature gave you uh, your intelligence. Nature gave you your artistic um, bent. Okay? So, uh, by, by nature, uh, if nature gave you those gifts, it will be uh, going against nature not to use those gifts. All right. So according to the universalizability principle, we can test any maxim. If the maxim is self-defeating because of condition one or two, then it is morally impermissible. Self-defeating means that acting on our maxim would not enable us to accomplish our goals. What follows from all this? It follows that acting morally is equivalent to acting rationally. And on the other hand, or conversely, acting immorally is equivalent to acting irrationally against the reason. So our moral duties are actions according to reason. Kant has a beautifully elaborate uh, procedure to say to you, you are immoral. And you can say to Kant, how do you know? Who are you to judge? Who are you to say that? And what's beautiful, once again, I'm going to use that word beautiful, is that Kant can say to you, it's not me, it's not I who are judging you. It is reason itself. Because you're doing something against reason. So categorical imperatives are not based on what I, what I want. So one could never change your mind about commandments of categorical imperatives. Doing so will be always irrational. Okay? So an ethic that relies on your personal feelings is not reliable. Only one that relies on duty, on unconditional and categorical duties. <clears throat> now, there is another component to, uh, to Kant's morality. The other component is um, if, you, uh, if you take a course of in ethics, most philosophers, most teachers teach you that the formula of humanity is just a, a different formulation of the universalizability principle. Uh, but I like to, uh, to actually make a distinction. The form of humanity says that we have to treat human beings as ends in themselves, not as mean to, to end. So in other words, you shouldn't use any human, any rational individual. You should always treat human beings who are rational 
with respect and treat them as ends, not use them. Okay? Not use them. What about Martians? If they are rational, then that applies to them. Not animals, not small children. They're not rational. Okay? Um, I don't know what Kant would say about children. Probably he would say that they are human beings after all, and they, they have the potential of being rational. But Kant doesn't say that. But we don't need to get into that. So I spoke about autonomy before, and, uh, and according to Kant, um, the will determines, determines <clears throat> its guiding principles for itself. So what Kant implies, as I explained in part one, we are rational, we have to be rational, only if we are rational and we have a free will, we are, we are not brainwashed or told what to do, can we uh, make moral judgments. Um, and uh, another component is the, uh, the kingdom of ends. So all maxims that we formulate must harmonize with the kingdom of ends. What is the kingdom of ends? I think what, what Kant has in mind is <clears throat> the, uh, the notion of the kingdom of ends in, um, in a sense of a, uh, like a paradise, like an ideal place where people are, human beings are perfectly rational and uh, they respect other rational individuals. So you, you, uh, you have to do morality by embracing um, this notion that a member, that you are a member in the universal realm of ends. And you have to treat all the other rational beings like ends in themselves. Okay. <clears throat> now about direct and indirect duties what about irrational individuals like dogs chickens and um, uh, babies and people with um, severe mental disabilities well according to Kant we don't have a direct moral duty or in other words this is what he means if I come to you and I punch you in the face I'm doing something wrong to you, not to anybody else. But in reality, Kant would put it this way. If you punch me in the face, you're also destroying, you're undermining your own dignity because by uh, wronging me, by hurting me, you are hurting humanity. You're, you're hurting rationality, ultimately. So you're doing something directly wrong to me. And perhaps to yourself, too. But if I kick your dog, I'm not doing anything that could be called immoral. Why do you think? Maybe I should ask you that question on the exam. But essentially, the, the reason is because dogs are not rational. So what does that mean, they're not rational? Well, remember what, what Kant's morality is all about? It's about rationality. Only individuals who are rational can meaningfully speak of moral or immoral. Okay? An object is not the, uh, a moral agent. Only moral agents can speak of morality. So a dog is not rational because a moral agent must be rational. If you are not rational, you are not a moral agent. You are what Kant calls an object okay and remember what he says objects can be replaced they have a price so in summary kant advocates an approach to ethics in which we perform actions according to uh, universal rules where do we get these rules well in a way kant says we already have these rules within ourselves <clears throat> because we are rational so we know these rules um, but what's important is that we have to, we need a, a good will. If you act in a way that is always 
um, springing out, coming from your goodwill, you're doing something more. It doesn't matter the consequences. It doesn't matter what happens next. But you can say, I did the right thing for the right reason. That's what morality is all about. If you say, oh, but look, I saved that person drowning. Um, sure, you did a good thing, but you didn't do it for the right reason. So your actions, call it whatever you want, call it good, but it's not moral. It doesn't have uh, the worth of morality. It doesn't get a check of approval, a moral approval, okay? Uh, so the will is good no matter what. And when and only when it, is, it acts out of pure respect for moral law, okay? Which is what is rational for everyone to do. <clears throat> we must treat all rational beings as ends in themselves, never exploit other rational individuals. And our conduct must fall under principles that can be advocated for all humanity, categorically, without any exceptions. Okay? Now, the only, uh, the only problem that I'm going to talk about here is a very famous problem. The problem of the, uh, uh, the inquiring murderer. This is a very famous thing in, in Kant's philosophy. Here is a, an inquiry murderer. There's a murderer. He's uh, looking for you. And, uh, and you hide in my apartment. You say, please, please, please open the door. Why? I'll explain to you later. Okay? Now, I come to, uh, I am, suppose I am the, uh, the murderer. And I knock on your door. And I say, hey, listen, I'm looking for a, uh, Paul, have you seen Paul? Why are you looking for Paul? Well, because I just want to break his legs. Um, actually, I have to be precise. Kant doesn't say that, of course. No, this is my supposition. It's only it, the example is only this: that uh, a a murderer knocks on your door. You're hiding your friend, and uh, and the murderer says, is this friend, is Paul in your house, in your apartment? What are you supposed to say to the murderer? Think about it for a moment. If you answered that you have to tell them the truth, kudos for you. You, uh, you understood perfectly Kant's philosophy. According to Kant, you have to tell the truth. But that's mind-blowing. Why would Kant say something like that? Well, here's the explanation of Kant. Suppose that you uh, you lie to your friend. I mean, sorry, you lie to the, uh, the criminal. You lie to the murderer. Why are you doing that? Obviously, you, wanna, you do that because you are thinking about the consequences. Remember? But Kant's morality does not permit to act in such a way to bring about uh, certain desirable consequences. Now you say to me, the heck with Kant. I don't care then. Why should I follow Kant? But here's a clever point that Kant makes. <clears throat> we don't know the consequences. We don't know the future. Suppose that, for example, the murderer knocks on your door, says, is Paul there? You say, no. Well, there are several options. One option is that you're not a good liar. The, uh, the, the murderer sees through your lie and kicks your door open, sees Paul and says, you lie to me, you bastard. And he kills you and also he kills Paul and he kills your family and your dog. That's horrible. So you see, Kant says, now you see what happened there. You lied, and you uh, you undermined your dignity as a, a rational individual because you uh, you you dirt yourself with a lie. Not only that, also the consequences of your actions, which you cannot possibly envision, lead to uh, a very 
undesirable consequence, and you cannot know that. You see? So, so in other words, Kant is saying it's always better to, uh, to tell the truth because if you tell the truth, you can emerge out of the uh, issue uh, by saying, at least I did what is right for the right reason. No one will ever uh, condemn me for telling the truth. Well, I'm not sure. In a, a modern society, probably most people would be inclined to saying, uh, why the heck did you do that? Why didn't you lie to the murderer? And that's the reason why. So Kant was very, uh, very firm about that. He says, no, you never lie, not even in that circumstance, not even, not even uh, uh, for, uh, to, uh, to a line, uh, to, um, to a murder. You never lie. You always do your duty. Because if you start lying, then once again, you're lying out of your personal preferences. And uh, things can change. All right? So, uh, once again, I'm going to end uh, this, um, this lecture, part two of Kant, right here. Um, you can always consult my PowerPoint presentation where I list a series of complaints about Kant's philosophy. Uh, but I will encourage you once again, you to think about these problems, and perhaps we can talk about them in a, in a forum discussion. Or, once again, you can email me and we can have a discussion about that. Okay, so uh, this is the end of uh, part two of lecture eight. Hope, as usual, you enjoyed it. I will see you next with lecture nine.